uh, and very excited about our topic this evening. And um, uh, when Preet, uh, the, let's uh, start off. I think this uh, dialogue is going to um, be in three sections. One is U.S.-India relationships and how that is going. Uh, the second is the um, uh, the upcoming elections and the uncertainty that is that revolves around that. And the third one is the India's uh, growth uh, trajectory. And then I'll have a few other questions. The first question um, uh, here, um, let us start by discussing the history, the brief history and the nature of the U.S.-India uh, relations. Uh, from what I read, it's uh, bittersweet right now. Uh, please paint a, a, a picture of the past, present, and future of this relationship for us uh, to get some context around it. Sure thing. Um, and thank you, Solomon, and thank you to the uh, World Affairs Council of Northern California uh, for inviting me. It's, it's really great to be back um, uh, here, here in the Bay Area. Um, th th this first question is an important one, and one that I think is important to set in context. Uh, but let me just start out maybe on what I think is the future of the U.S.-India relationship um, uh, with a bit of an audacious statement which is that uh, I think that India will be the most important strategic partner for the United States in the 21st century. Um, now, I admit this is a bit of an audacious statement, um, but let me back up and give a little bit of context to why I believe this. Um, the relationship between the United States and India has grown tremendously, and it's grown through the support of uh, uh, administrations, both Republican and Democratic, uh, strong bipartisan support from the U.S. Congress, as well as uh, various governments in India uh, from different political affiliations. And so across the political spectrum, there's a lot of uh, convergence for the strength of this relationship. Um, in recent times, uh, you may remember that uh, following uh, the uh, uh, nuclear weapons test, um, President Clinton actually made an historic visit to India to try to reopen uh, the conversation and the relationship that had somewhat frayed. Um, following that, you had George W. Bush really try to bring the relationship to a more strategic level when uh, he and Prime Minister Manmohan Singh at the time embarked on creating a U.S.-India Civil Nuclear Cooperation Agreement, uh, which is in effect now. And then we had uh, President Obama, um, under whose administration I had the privilege to serve, in which I think we brought uh, and worked hard at bringing the relationship to heights that we had never seen before, um, where we tried to develop a relationship that wasn't just about how we could help each other, but frankly, how working together, the United States and India could try to address global challenges, from global peacekeeping, to climate change, to cybersecurity. For example, today, uh, at least when we uh, were in office uh, in the last administration, um, we built the first ever bilateral uh, cybersecurity framework uh, with India. We had that with no other country in the world. So there is a lot of ways in which we tried to really uh, work with India in a much more strategic way. And I would say even um, in this administration, we can talk about that more later if you'd like, but even in this administration, in the Trump administration, they have made a concerted effort to, to try to strengthen um, uh, uh, their a vision of seeing India as an anchor across a broader Indo-Pacific policy uh, that they have put forward. And you know, all these efforts aren't just one-sided. Um, India, too, has, has really sought to, to shed its non-aligned roots. Um, these, are, these are roots that were uh, a result of a really complicated uh, history of colonialism uh, following its independence and that really colored India's view uh, of how to best engage with the rest of the world. Um, and so they too have shown a willingness to more strategically align with the United States that we haven't seen 
uh, before. And so uh, I think we are at a, a very good point in time uh, with our relationship with, with India. I think we are continuing to engage on a number of different fronts, strategic, security, economic. Um, we, we also, here in the United States, boast a very uh, strong um, and affluent, actually, Indian American community. So from a diaspora point of view, from a people to people point of view, um, there's also a strong connection there. So there are a lot of things, I think, going well for this relationship. Um, there are, of course, some challenges, as you have challenges in any relationship, and I'd be happy to talk about those as you wish. Um, but I am uh, quite sanguine on, on, on the future. Very good. Um, I think you should be, we'll be asking some general questions to put the topic on the table. So please write down your questions, uh, and we can answer them later as uh, in the session. The second uh, broad brush question uh, is, in the light of the upcoming elections, uh, can you give some background uh, that leads up to the current political climate uh, that uh, seems to be very uncertain right now? You're talking about the Indian elections, yes. right? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I'm an Indian. <laughs> um, there, there are other elections, as you well know, yes, yes. coming that also produce quite a bit of uncertainty, so I just wanted to clarify. Um, no, listen, I think, uh, I think we're, we're witnessing um, an interesting time in India. Um, if uh, you recall back to when uh, Prime Minister Modi and the BJP um, uh, gained power uh, back in 2014. Um, they rose to power with uh, the strongest mandate of any single party in over 30 years. Um, and it was done on a, a, a very well thought out uh, campaign strategy um, built on uh, the concepts of good governance and strong development and growth. Um, and so as a result, you saw a number of reform initiatives come out of the Modi government. Um, make in India, skill India, digital India, startup India, smart cities, I mean, you name it. Um, and there is an initiative out there uh, to try to contribute to the growth and development uh, of India. Um, and Modi himself has uh, certainly uh, come out as a very strong leader. Whether you agree with his policies or not, it's hard not to agree that he's, he's a strong leader in the country. Um, and in fact, uh, even though um, as a party, there has been a lot of criticisms uh, of the way in which the BJP has governed. Um, as an individual, Prime Minister Modi still enjoys an overwhelming amount of popular support. Um, there was a Pew poll uh, taken um, uh, last year in which nine out of 10 Indians um, showed that they had a favorable opinion of Prime Minister Modi. That is unprecedented. Um, if you think about it. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, as many successes as they have had, and they have had sex successes, they've been able to really drastically expand their power at the state level, the BJP has, um, you know, governing eight states in 2014 to now up to 20. This is out of a total of 29. Um, that's, that's considerable. Um, but Despite those successes, there still are, I think, some major challenges that make um, the general election slated for, for some time at the beginning or in the first half of next year um, uh, create some type, level of uncertainty. And, and I'll just tick off a few. Um, one is that as much as there have been promises around some of these growth and development goals, um, the, the promises have, have not necessarily been kept uh, to the degree that the populace would like. Um, one uh, shining example is around farmers and farmer incomes. 
in which the Modi government um, has promised to double farmers' incomes, um, and woefully short of of achieving that goal um, by the time that they had set out for it. Farmer and agriculture sector, obviously, a key constituency. Um, another factor I would point to is just a general um, anti-incumbency um, uh, factor that exists in Indian politics, where you will see, unlike I think here in the United States, where the incumbent enjoys an inordinate amount of uh, 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 popularity, um, some of it entrenched and institutional, uh, some of it otherwise, um, in India, sometimes it's quite the opposite, that uh, if you're an incumbent, you're sometimes actually uh, at a disadvantage um, for, for getting reelected. Uh, so that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, a third is that even though we don't necessarily have, um, I would say, a charismatic opposition, uh, we do have a determined one, um, and one that seems to be willing to engage even with some regional parties to try to form coalitions. Um, and so there are new strategies being developed that could pose a challenge to uh, the current government. Um, and then finally, I think there is a bit of a, um, uh, I would say, not necessarily black swan, but, but uh, an area uh, around social tensions in the country that could flare up um, and and really sway sway the election. And here I'm talking about some of the communal tension and resulting violence that has occurred in the country um, over the last couple of years. And this could have an inordinate effect uh, on the elections as well. So there are a number of areas where I think um, despite uh, the great enthusiasm for India's economy, which I know we'll talk about later, um, there is there are some concerns uh, that could could make for a more uncertain uh, election outcome. And one of those promises uh, was uh, the hundred uh, or so smart cities that uh, I don't even see one, not even at the foundation level. And so that's another you know it was a big deal that was made, but and we got all excited and uh, he had my students and me come and develop frameworks, but nothing happened on that. so we, that's another big disappointment. The third uh, area that uh, we, let's talk a little bit about India's uh, growth uh, trajectory. Uh, speak to us about US-India's uh, current misalignment of growth and job creation and the concern over the falling rupee against the US dollar. Well, maybe I'll first talk about India's growth, and maybe not irrespective of other countries, um, I think we are seeing unprecedented growth um, in India. Um, for the first time, India is now the sixth largest economy in the world, surpassing France earlier this year. Um, the World Bank has projected that they will be the fastest growing major economy over the next three years. Um, if this trajectory maintains itself, which people are expecting it to, uh, India will become the third largest economy in the world in the next decade. These are huge, monumental shifts. Uh, this can do a number of things in terms of, of course, India's power and status in the world, um, its own economic development, being able to lift uh, millions, if not tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, out of poverty and into the middle, of cl middle class. Um, but I think it's actually more than that. Um, I think this is an actual, actually an opportunity for India to leapfrog into new economic sectors and be a part of it, uh, be a parting of the leading edge of, of new economies that could shape how uh, trade and investment is done around the world. And going back to my earlier point about why I think uh, India will be the most strategic partner, 
most important strategic partner for the United States in the 21st century. This is a key part of that. You know, if we look at where the gro where growth is going to happen in the world over the next few decades, it is absolutely going to be in in Asia. And if India is going to be the fastest growing large economy that's powering that engine, it makes absolute strategic and economic sense for us here in the United States to to have a much better um, relationship, economic relationship with India. So. We've come a long way um, from the you know, 1991 financial crisis in India prompting then finance minister Manmohan Singh to put forward some really strong uh, economic and fiscal reforms, trade liberalization measures, to fast forward to today where uh, I think almost every Fortune 100 company uh, looks at India as being a key market uh, for their own growth prospects. Uh, so uh, I think there's uh, a lot of uh, interest in seeing uh, both from the private sector and, as I mentioned, from the public side, seeing uh, us being uh, or being able to contribute to that, that growth story. Um, the Indians recognize this too. Uh, I mean, there's a reason why Prime Minister Modi has put so much effort behind uh, improving India's ranking on the, the, the World Bank's ease of doing business report. Um, they need foreign direct investment. They need that foreign direct investment because they have tremendous needs in building up infrastructure, uh, uh, um, producing more of a services economy, um, and importantly, job creation. Um, this is a country where 65% uh, where, uh, of the populace is under the age of 35. Now just think about that. If 65% of your population is under the age of 35, what does that mean in terms of potential, of being able to really power an economy uh, and have a bright future and improve productivity and contribute to innovation, as you well know. But then what's the flip side, the challenge? And in India, you have a million people coming into the workforce every month. A million people. You know, we like to celebrate when there's over 200,000 jobs created every month here in the United States. Imagine having to, yeah. to try to tackle a million people a month. So these are some really big challenges. And so it will necessitate uh, foreign direct investment, foreign capital, um, but it'll necessitate it in a way in which um, those companies are actually contributing to India's growth, not just growing their own profits. And I think, um, the Indian government is acutely aware of this um, and, uh, and is doing all that it can, uh, given that it is also going through its own change uh, in terms of economic structures uh, to try to attract that type of capital. So what do you say then if the growth is around 7% or 7 plus, I think I read, but the job creation has not kept up with that, it's lagging, and what ca what's causing that? You would think growth means jobs. And uh, so there's something there that, um, that's happening in the economy that needs to be fixed. Well, it, as I mentioned, it's, it's an economy that's going through changes. Um, you know, you have, um, you have historically what has been a largely agrarian-based economy. Um, and from a people point of view, you still have upwards of 60% of the population living in rural areas. Um, doesn't mean that they're all in agriculture, um, but it does mean that there's, we are going to see a shift. Um, you're seeing more and more people move into urban, semi-urban, peri-urban areas. Um, that's gonna change the nature of uh, the economy. There's gonna be much more demand on infrastructure and services as a result, it's gonna exacerbate uh, the ability for the government to provide 
for some of the basic services as well, whether it be power or housing or water. Um, so these are huge challenges. Um, and so uh, just having investment, which of course is improved, is not enough. Um, you have to have an enabling environment and a policy framework that helps to channel some of that investment into growth areas, but also areas that serve development purposes. And, you know, the government is trying this, but it, it takes time. We know even in our own country uh, what it's like to have jobless growth. Um, and so these are difficult issues, ones that are trying to tackle. So yeah, the lag is just temporary and transient. Eventually, it'll catch up. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't yeah. put it that. I, I think it takes active measures uh, to try to try to channel those funds and that investment towards areas that will be uh, for higher employment, manufacturing, for example. But you get the point. Sure. Um, let me ask you a few other questions. Um, uh, what was achieved thus far by the current Indian administration that is helping move U.S. Uh, relationship, U.S. and India relations forward? What are some of the things, big achievements that you see? So I'll be the, f the first to say that, um, you know, my expectations when uh, the Trump administration came into power for the U.S.-India rela relationship were actually um, uh, quite modest. Um, and they were modest maybe not for the reason that you think which is I felt like in the Obama administration, um, we had done a lot, as I'd mentioned before, to, to really put together the strategic framework of the relationship and what we wanted to do together. You know, we had a joint vision for the Asia Pacific and the Indian Ocean region. We had that cybersecurity framework I mentioned. We had um, we worked very closely with the Indians on the Paris uh, Climate Accords. Um, there were a number of things that we worked together on, kind of building that strategic frame. And I had some, uh, maybe unfounded now, but some modest hope that the Trump administration would then would now uh, come in. And rather than try to reformulate uh, you know, some of these strategic frameworks, would actually do deals, mm. right? Put some meat on the bones of some of the things that we already had in place. After all, um, if you recall, then candidate Trump had talked a lot about doing deals. Um, and I had even written soon after the administration coming into power and saying, um, you know, the Trump administration does not seem to have any new strategy with respect to India, and that that's a good thing, that it's actually time uh, to get some transactions underway um, to show what the potential of this relationship actually could be. We haven't seen that yet. Um, we have seen, as I mentioned or alluded to before, an articulation around a broader Indo-Pacific strategy uh, that the administration has put forward, and certainly singling out India as being a key feature, a key relationship, strategic partner. Um, we've also seen, I think, some important incremental steps uh, to that end. Um, we've seen um, uh, the administration, for example, grant India um, a strategic uh, trade authorization status. It's, it sounds a little wonky, but it actually helps facilitate in our export control regime system. It, 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 it's, it actually really does help facilitate the transfer of technologies uh, to India. Um, in a recent uh, dialogue that our Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense had with their counterparts in India just last month, um, there were a number of additional announcements of how we were going to work together. And I should say, you know, just having that, they call it a two plus two, um, where you have the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense meet their counterparts. Just having that mechanism is important. Uh, it's not revolutionary, but it's important. Uh, we tend, in the U.S. government, we tend to reserve that mechanism for treaty allies. 
And so it's a strong signal of showing the kind of what we what kind of relationship we want to have with India. And even in those conversations, um, though largely strategic and security focused, there were some uh, incremental pieces of pro progress. Um, you know, we saw um, uh, what they call a Kamkasa agreement uh, reached. This is a communications foundational agreement between our militaries so that they can speak to each other uh, more easily. It allows for interoperability uh, between our systems and technologies. Um, this can be hugely beneficial, uh, whether on the seas or in the air of our militaries being able to, to work with each other. Um, believe it or not, there were instances where you know, commanders at sea were having to communicate by WhatsApp uh, because they didn't have uh, the right platforms to be able to communicate properly. So these, these are not sexy things, but these are important things. Um, and so th there, there are things that we've made progress on, and I give due credit to both the Trump administration and the Modi admin, uh, government uh, in being able to, to, to do these things. But I wouldn't say that they have been revolutionary. Um, and what I fear more than anything is that um, the relationship will not plateau. I, in my mind, um, keeping status quo is a win in this administration's foreign policy. Um, my, my fear is more that we don't have the people in place to really do the hard work of maintaining diplomatic relations, making progress on these issues, and God forbid there being some type of crisis, being able to respond accordingly. You're, we, talking, there about are both, still, you're talking about both sides, or just one side? Or? No, I, I'm talking from the US side. Um, there have always been capacity constraints on the Indian side, but I'm talking about from the US side, where there are still unfilled posts in key positions in the US government. and. Um, uh, I am concerned about that. And how about what other improvements that the current administration from the Indian administration can do to make it further? One or two critical areas that might be good if you were to give advice to uh, the current administration, what would that advice be? To the Trump administration? No, to, to, uh, to, to the Modi India, government? In, in, yes, Modi government. Yeah, so you know, being a former US government official, I, I, I tend to bristle to try to give advice to foreign governments. Um, but w what I will say is this. Um, you know, I think there are lots of opportunity to be able to make progress um, from a non-governmental point of view. There is a huge amount of interest from US private sector in being able to trade and invest in India. And I use the term private sector loosely. These are not just multinational companies. There are non-governmental organizations. There are international institutions. There are diaspora communities. Um, and so I, w I think there's tremendous opportunity for those types of actors to play a very useful role in India's development and growth, whether it's education or renewable energy or um, financial services, I mean, you name the sector, and there's a lot of opportunity in India. Um, and, you know, a lot of it just comes from scale. When you have 1.3 billion people in a country, um, there's lots of opportunities to test innovations to scale. And so uh, I would encourage there to be more openness in working with those types of actors. You know, India is one of those countries, uh, one of those few countries in Asia where the Trump's decision to pull out, pull the U.S. out of the um, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement was greeted with uh, some relief. What kind of new trade and investment relationships with India emerged as a result of this? Was it favorable to India? So, you know, I, I think that was a big mistake. Uh, just, you know, my own opinion, pulling out of uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, I think it, it was both in our strategic and economic interest um, here in the United States uh, 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 to move forward on that effort. Um, I think you're right that there was a bit of a sigh of relief from India. Um, but at the same time, I think it would have been in India's interest 
maybe not in the short term, um, but I think it would have raised the bar of uh, providing a trading framework that allowed for the types of um, you know tariff, non-tariff barriers, uh, uh, you know uh, that would be acceptable and non-acceptable, um, providing the right type of um, environmental standards, uh, labor standards that you would want. Um, and I think that would have been beneficial for the world, including for India, in the long run. Um, unfortunately, we haven't seen anything take its place. Um, interestingly, uh, this past summer, the, the, the administration put forward um, uh, uh, a big announcement on its Indo-Pacific uh, policy. Uh, they had Secretaries Pompeo, our Secretary of State and Secretary Ross, our Secretary of Commerce, uh, as well as our Secretary Perry, our Secretary of Energy, all come together to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and make these big speeches uh, around, you know, wanting to focus on the Indo-Pacific region, why that's important for the United States. Um, Secretary Pompeo talked a lot about um, this being an opportunity to work with like-minded countries um, to reinforce. Um, an international rules-based system um, to respect, you know, the territorial sovereignty uh, of various countries. Um, so he gave a, a grand speech about why this is important. I think a speech that, frankly, any one of his predecessors, whether in the uh, uh, Obama or Bush uh, administrations, could have given. Um, and then Secretary Ross came on stage uh, and was asked point blank about TPP, and now that the administration has pulled out, what what is the replacement? What you know? What what is your alternative vision? And I think everybody struggled to understand what that was. Um, there were comments about how this this administration does not uh, necessarily believe in multilateral trade arrangements. Okay, what types of bilateral trade arrangements? have you engaged on? Hadn't, didn't hear too much about that either. Um, instead, there was a conversation that got started about trade deficits. As if trade deficits are the barometer of an economic relationship, which is puzzling, uh, to say the least. Now, I'm not an economist, but if you think about trade deficits as being the only indicator of an economic relationship, it seems to me it's a pretty myopic view um, because obviously there's a lot more uh, that you would want to look at. And it flew in the face of the speech that Secretary Pompeo had given just minutes earlier about there being kind of a grander strategy. So my answer to your question is I don't know of another vision. Um, I am anxiously waiting. All right. Let me ask uh, you my last question here, and then we'll take the questions from the audience. You know, um, India uh, has a lot to gain with the U.S. Uh, partnership. Um, I think India needs U.S. more uh, than uh, U.S. needs India. Um, US, India is, uh, U.S. is the second largest trade partner for India, third largest source of uh, FDI, uh, over 500 U.S. companies, uh, U.S. companies operate in India, creating jobs. Uh, over 200 Indian firms are in the United States, uh, prospering and uh, sending money back. 3.6 billion contribution from uh, uh, um, Indian students in the U.S., which means that uh, they too will create more uh, wealth for their country and uh, well-being. And, and I also think that uh, this H-1B uh, visa restriction is a plus to India because if all the smart people just come here and there's no one left there to run it. So I think in a way it's a blessing in disguise for me. Um, and uh, with all this, where India really needs U.S. Uh, more than U.S. needs India, um, you know, maybe that's my perception is wrong there. Then why do we tick U.S. off with these uh, tariffs on U.S. products being sold in India and 
and um, and why do we do things like you know working buying oil from Iran and and uh, buying armaments from Russia? Why do we do this? I mean, why is there something more here that I'm not seeing? So, so you covered a lot of ground there. So let me let me pick out a few of those things. Sure. And if I miss them, please please tell me, and I'll go back. Um, so, you know, in terms of relationships, um, you know, in some ways, these big bilateral relationships are not dissimilar from human relationships. Um, I wouldn't say that one party needs the other one more than the other. We need each other, and. Uh, there, there are numerous reasons um, why, and I think going back to what I had mentioned before at the outset, is that we've really positioned um, our relationship with India now at a point where we want to work with India for the benefit of the world. Um, whether it's tackling global issues like climate change or uh, threat streams like tra transnational terrorist organizations um, or just trying to keep the peace through peacekeeping operations. So there's a lot that we want to do together. Now, also like human relationships, that doesn't mean that there aren't tiffs uh, from time to time. And with India, um, I think it's safe to say that there's been, there has always been a little bit of tension, especially on the trade agenda. Um, there's reason for this. Uh, you know, the United States has been, up until this point, I guess, um, one of the strongest champions for, for free trade around the world. Um, you know, we have uh, helped to build an, a set of international institutions that promote the free flow of capital. Uh, across the world because we believe that through market economies um, that this will help to lift many out of poverty and provide opportunity. Um, in India, that hasn't always been the rationale. Um, as I mentioned before, it really took the 91 financial crisis for there to be a real change in mindset of trying to open up more. And I think India is still on that journey. And so uh, as much as, for example, the Modi government would love to invite more and more uh, foreign direct investment into its country, it also has to negotiate a complicated set of internal political actors, including its own party, the BJP, which um, historically has um, had some protectionist tendencies, um, and its own Indian private sector, who may seem a little reluctant to invite competition um, in various sectors. So I think we're gonna continue to see a kind of two steps forward, one step back type of dynamic. That doesn't mean that progress isn't being made and that we ought not to continue to try to push uh, for the economy to open up even more. Um, but it does mean there will be these hiccups along the way. Um, you mentioned, if you want, if you'd like, you mentioned a couple of specific examples. Um, so, you know, for, with Iran, for example, um, you know, the Indians like to talk about the very, you know, the historical and civilizational relationship that India has had with Iran, um, and and I think it's worth us. Maybe we don't have to agree, but at least understanding where that comes from. Uh, there is a very large Shia population in India, um, in one of the largest states in India that has some political power. Um, there are some very real uh, energy needs that India has to fuel the kind of growth that we were talking about before. Um, there are some very real strategic investments that India would like to make like in Chabahar port in Iran, which by the way, some of us here in the United States think that that's not necessarily a bad idea if it provides another supply line uh, to Afghanistan uh, versus through Pakistan where we've had our issues. So 
These are a complicated set of factors um, that push India to continue to try to have an energy trading relationship with Iran. It's worth keeping these things in mind um, as we think about sanctions. Um, with Russia, as you also mentioned, uh, probably referring to the recent um, air uh, missile defense system that India is purchasing from Russia. I mean, historically, India has had a long-standing defense relationship uh, with Russia and the Soviet Union before that. Um, and so a lot of their existing infrastructure, defense infrastructure, is based on that technology. Um, I think India is looking to diversify that. Um, they are, of course, buying more from us now. I mean, we are looking at a situation where, you know, we had uh, zero defense trade just about 15, 20 years ago to now having $15 billion of defense trade. Um, so we're making progress on that front, but it takes time. Uh, so these are the kind of dynamics that we have to keep in mind. So in one sense, U.S. has to be more understanding of India its relationship with Iran, because it's historical. It has a, a population there that they had to deal with. Plus, Iranian oil is cheaper, than probably than the US, maybe. Uh, so I think that is something that probably, uh, in surpassing sanctions, maybe US need to understand that situation there, that relationship. Same thing with Russia. I mean, you said, well, we have been um, having all this infrastructure, military infrastructure, it's like you have a typewriter, with the ink cartridge, and uh, you don't throw the typewriter away, you buy the cartridge. So maybe that's why they're buying some of this stuff from Russia. So that there's also something that you need to understand uh, in the light of that and not pass any sanctions. So you think US has been a little insensitive uh, given the picture that you gave us. Maybe we need to be more understanding here in the US yeah. of India and why they're doing what they're doing. So, so I'll say two things on that. One is we've got better typewriters. <laughs> yeah. And they know that. And I think we have to be able to compete in a way that allows for that transition to take place. Um, but India will have to make a choice. Um, continuing on this path of diversifying uh, in their defense sector in my mind, is not sustainable. Because, as I was talking about interoperability before, they need to be able to have interoperability between their own systems. And we're going to have some issues of India buying our technology uh, if that technology then somehow gets exposed to actors like Russia. So they will have to make a choice at some point. Um, the second thing I'd say is we have to remember what the motivations behind these sanctions are. And while I'm sure um, those in the administration and on the Hill you know, think very carefully about sanctions before they're implemented, I am also sure that India was not a motivating factor. And so India is dealing with the consequence of um, a sanctions regime that is based on completely different foreign policy priorities. And we have to do our best to try to manage sure. the fallout from that. But it's important to remember this uh, as we go forward. She has some questions from the audience. Uh, does India view China as a friend or foe? Um, good question. So you'll notice that I haven't talked about China at all. <laughs> um, and that's on purpose. Uh, I think much is, much is, too much is made uh, about viewing the, the U.S. relationship with India through the lens of China. Um, I can certainly attest from my time in government that while that was certainly part of the conversation, it was not the driving part of the conversation. Um, and so uh, I, I don't mean to belittle the question at all. I, I think it's a good question, uh, or the right issue to raise, but I also don't want that to overwhelm uh, this conversation. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of consternation in India around China. Um, 
I think that is why uh, actually you're starting to see some of the stalwarts of the then non-aligned movement now feel comfortable from moving away from that type of strategic autonomy mindset because they recognize what China is doing in the neighborhood. Um, selling subs to one neighbor, building a base on, with another neighbor, taking over a port on another neighbor, um, the kinds of things that they're doing across the Indian Ocean region where something like you know, 40% of all container traffic travels. Um, these are all major issues. They're issues we care about. They're issues the Indians care about as well. Um, and so, so yes, I think there's a lot of consternation about India. I think it's a bit too simplistic to talk about it as friend or foe, of course, and, uh, and I realize that's not, the, not necessarily where the questioner was coming from, but, um, but there is a renewed sense of urgency to think about how India can deal with China on the global stage, which is, again, uh, just going back to my original point, why I think the U.S.-India relationship will be the most important one for the 21st century. But we have seen some improvement with uh, U.S.-India on the business side. Uh, <coughs> last, I think, two two weeks ago, I think uh, I had uh, the co-founder of Xiaomi, which is a, a Chinese company that uh, captured 30% of the India's cell phone market, and they're rapidly expanding. They said, we love your country. We... Uh, because they are able to give them a quality, the poor person, a quality of an iPhone at one-fourth the price. And everyone is buying it. So it's high value, low price, which Indians value because they're very price sensitive. And here's a Chinese company that captured, you know, 30% of the market and, and, and they're saying we love India. And they want to do more, and so it's uh, so in in some areas, I think, uh, in business wise, we made some good progress uh, in in that sense. Um, uh, and so I think, but I, I I don't know about the other other ways that uh, that we are um, uh, whether we made any progress there. Uh, but the next question here is about Pakistan. How has India's relationship with Pakistan evolved over the last decade? That's another country I didn't mention. <laughs> uh, again, not because I don't think it's important, uh, but uh, so much of our conversation here in the United States tends to look at India through the lens of another relationship. And so I wanted to focus on what we're trying to do from the United States perspective. Um, getting to the question, you know, I think... Um, Unfortunately, we haven't seen a lot of change in the relationship. Um, there are some entrenched uh, forces um, within Pakistan that uh, in some ways need the status quo um, uh, or an escalation of tensions uh, to justify their own uh, existence. And we started to see some of this actually play out. Um, you know, when I was at the State Department, there was some effort made by uh, Prime Minister Modi and, and Prime Minister Sharif at the time uh, to try to re-engage in a diplomatic dialogue, um, try to restart conversations on a number of outstanding um, issues that are between the two countries. Um, and as soon as the first uh, engagements took place. Uh, soon after that, we saw cross-border attacks. Uh, this is not by accident. Uh, and so um, since then, I think we haven't seen uh, much of an effort, at least not publicly. Uh, I'm not in government anymore. I couldn't tell you, well, I couldn't tell you then either, what might be done behind the scenes. But um, uh, but certainly publicly, it doesn't seem like Prime Minister Modi has either the political space or willingness at this point, certainly, of course, coming um, uh, right before the elections. And we have a new prime minister in Pakistan um, who is still getting his bearings. So I don't foresee there being a lot of change uh, in the relationship in the near future either, again, unfortunately. 
Uh, next question is about uh, India is a country where many different ethnic groups, people groups and different languages work together, a different religious background, diversified. But they work together beautifully and there's been a great success. What is the secret um, of India that uh, lives in harmony, uh, you know, and, um, and what can they learn or what can the world learn from it? Well, I, I joke with my friends and family about this. I say, well, everybody lives really in harmony because they have to. They all live on top of each other. Um, but I only say that in jest. Uh, in reality, there are a lot of tensions in India. Um, and I think it's important not to romanticize uh, what's actually happening in the country. Um, I had mentioned some communal tensions earlier. Um, there are some real vicious acts of violence taking place uh, along communal lines being stoked by uh, many uh, extreme uh, groups, um, perhaps for political purposes, perhaps because that's their ideology, it's hard to say, uh, but there are some real tensions uh, taking place in India. Um, I have said, and I've written actually, that you know there's, there's some interesting parallels happening between the United States and India right now. Um, you know, we're both uh, uh, multicultural, multi-religious, multi-ethnic, uh, multilingual societies where we're seeing this rising force of nationalism try to pick apart and create divisiveness in society uh, for political gain. And so it's going to be a real test of the resilience of our societies uh, to be able to, to withstand that and come out stronger. Um, and so we're in an interesting time, both here in the United States and in India on this front. The next question is about uh, the economic disparity as the, the economy uh, grows and the growth is experienced in India, it also adversely affects some Indians. And you think the gap between the rich and the poor, because 70% of our population, almost 70% lives in villages. Uh, we don't, mo uh, and most of the world doesn't make products and services for the poor. It makes it for the rich, uh, but they have deep pockets. So now, so there's a whole lot of bottom of the pyramid there that is unaddressed. And so is the gap widening and this economic prosperity and growth that we are seeing is only among the elite or is it uh, equally distributed? So um, great question. And, you know, um, I, I, I try to remind folks that as much growth as we are seeing in India, um, there are still over 300 million people living on less than $1.25 a day. Um, that's roughly the population of the United States, uh, living on less than $1.25 a day in India. Um, and so as much as we have seen growth li lift millions and millions into the middle class in India, we actually have also seen, seen inequality widen um, in that the, the rich and the uh, uber rich have gotten even richer. Um, and some of the, 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 the most poor off uh, have, have, have stagnated. Um, and so uh, this will be a challenge uh, for India, um, not only because it's a moral imperative uh, to try to provide for those that are the most vulnerable, but because it could create some real social tensions in the country. Um, especially if those who are poor uh, tend to also be of particular caste, class, or religion. And so um, this will be something that the, the government and others will have to be very mindful of. Mm -hmm. One way UC Berkeley is involved with this uh, gap situation is we're building prototypes of smart villages in India. Um, so we have done several prototypes. We took a lot of uh, Silicon Valley companies like Google's and so on to develop products for the poor that they can afford. It'll be useful to them rather than throw 
a gadget that has 10 belts and 20 vessels that the farmer doesn't know what, what to do with and can't afford it. So that has been a very successful pilot. Uh, Indian government has, uh, is investing in this, and Berkeley has signed an MOU with them. Uh, I just finished a book. It's on Amazon. It's called Smart Villages of Tomorrow. Uh, this is an actual prototype going on right now, and so I think that's something that that's one way that we as a university and academic institution is trying to help bridge that gap. This next question is: You mentioned that uh, a lot of young people, uh, you know, form the base of India. How is the educational system is preparing and uh, the skill development so these people can get employed and? Uh, and contribute to the Indian uh, economic prosperity? And it's a great question, and it's an important question. Um, you know, we tend to, here in the United States, tend to think about um, the really elite uh, institutions of higher education that exist in India, the IITs and the IIMs, and so many of those graduates end up coming to the United States. Um, but they are very much uh, the privileged, the cream of the crop. Um, and um, while there are many, many other um, institutions of higher education, uh, certainly not enough capacity um, to, to meet the demand, as I had mentioned before, in terms of the demographics. Um, and so there has been an effort put forward by uh, uh, the Modi government to really focus in on skills development and to try to find pathways for young people to develop the kinds of skills that will get them uh, good paying jobs. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean um, an engineering degree or a medical degree or a, uh, another degree of, of higher education, but perhaps the right types of skill sets and training um, that can put them towards a, a path of having uh, uh, a, good, a good, uh, good living. Um, uh, unfortunately, today, um, you know, the environment in India is is very much that you know, uh, the the son or daughter of uh, uh, in the household will follow the exact same uh, vocation or livelihood that that their parents do because they're just not exposed to anything else. Um, and so, I think there are some efforts underway. But this is, this is going to be an area of increased focus, uh, given, given the challenge. Another way that uh, UC Berkeley is helping with this educational and skill development gap uh, is because most of our people live in villages using digital technology, cell phones. And we are pivoting different technologies where if you want to repair a refrigerator or air conditioner or a car uh, you, using VR and AR uh, by with a cell phone, will uh, transmit the picture and they tell how to repair it and how to, uh, and so it's creating new jobs. And this is something that we're doing in villages. It's working great. We have a, a German company called Heller that came and taught young people who are jobless in villages to repair cars in, six, in, in a few months. And they're earning 30,000 rupees a month now. And they're employed way before they graduate. So these are new ways of how you empower people using digital technology, and uh, you are in villages doing this. And, um, and it's a new trend, and I'm hoping that uh, this will continue further. I see that we came to the end of our time. I will uh, open up for more questions here, but I just want to thank uh, Manpreet Anand for being our guest today, and uh, great conversation, great insight, a lot of wisdom there. It's, it's all in that beard there that I say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and thank you, and th you have been a great audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>